the mask issue. The governor has weighed in on potential uh, repercussions for school districts that don't abide by his executive order. The lieutenant governor has also weighed in, going a step further, kind of threatening to withhold state funding. But with you as the chief enforcer of the law in the Commonwealth, how are you planning to enforce it for school districts that don't abide by it? Well, I mean, listen, we're telling everybody trust the legal process. Uh, I think what the governor's executive order simply showed is that parents matter. Uh, the governor's executive order does not take away any parent's right to mask their child. If you come to the conclusion that the very best way to keep my child safe is for them to wear a mask six, seven, eight hours a day in school, that's fantastic. That is your right. That right has not been taken away. It also says there are going to be other parents who maybe reach a very different conclusion. I've had parents come to me that says, my child's asthmatic. This is having a detrimental impact on my child's, um, my child's health. I've had another parent that says, my child wears uh, glasses and wearing, wearing a mask eight hours a day. It's fogging. And my, my daughter has gone from being a all A student to a mostly C student because they are just miserable in this mask. And the idea is every parent should reach that conclusion on their own. That's in our Virginia code. Parents have a fundamental right to the upbringing and education of their children. And so we're just reasserting parents matter. Let parents reach that conclusion. Um, and what so about school boards that say, no, we're not going to enforce it. How do you plan to enforce it on those districts? Well, we're going to have the courts make that decision. I mean, we're going to defend the governor's executive orders in court. Uh, we're going to say that this is part of both parental empowerment. And uh, the bottom line is the governor has this authority under his emergency powers as well during the pandemic. I mean, think about it. The school board said the governor had the right to close our schools, to require masks, on uh, close churches, close businesses. But now the school boards are saying, oh, no, you don't have a right to make a determination that says, hey, you know what, on this area, we're going to let parents make that decision. So potential criminal charges, any civil penalties for districts? This is not a criminal. This is not a criminal case by any means. The courts are going to make a determination. Ultimately, this is going to be decided by the Virginia Supreme Court. They can mm -hmm. decide whether there is going to be uh, the governor's executive order upholds the legal, legal, the legal challenge. My full expectation, though, is regardless of the governor's executive order, there's going to be a legislative fix as well that's going to be codified in the Code of Virginia. And in that area, if it's codified in the Code of Virginia, a school board can't simply ignore the code. You know, we're going to go to court and seek injunctive relief for them to make sure they comply. There could uh, be a stopgap in the Senate, though. Could be, but we're reaching indications and, and uh, you know, from folks that's saying that they realize that this has become problematic. And I, th I think that the key reason why I'm respectfully press pressing you on yeah. the possibility for enforcement is, you know, your supporters, the governor's supporters, the lieutenant governor's supporters who back this executive order, surely they want to know how the state's going to enforce it for districts that don't apply. Well, everything, as we, we are, we, we have a Virginia Constitution, we have a separation of powers, right? So in all those times, when you have an executive branch and this type of local government that are reaching a different conclusion, you go through the legal process. And that's why you have the courts. Last thing I have on the mask, then, yeah. surely we'll move on. Um, in your office's move to dismiss that initial case with the Chesapeake parents, right. that it's a, to affirm that parents matter. Playing devil's advocate, if, what about the parents, rather, what about the parents who want to send their kids to school, in-person learning, uh, but they're around kids that are not masked, some maybe unvaccinated, do those parents matter as well? What I'm saying to all those parents is recognize we live in a pluralistic society. You absolutely have a right to have your masked child for seven or eight hours a day. But recognize there are going to be other parents who reach a different conclusion. Somebody who's a parent of somebody with asthma somebody the child with glasses that it's fogging up constantly and their grades have gone from all A's to almost all C's. And recognize other parents are going to reach a different conclusion and that's okay. We live in a pluralistic society. They have a right to master their child. Respect the fact that another parent who's going to be in a different situation than your own is going to reach a different conclusion. That's the only way we can function in a pluralistic society. Another news item of the day. Okay. Um, your office is taking a pretty hard stance on abortion cases. Um, the news within the last couple of minutes that we got the push alert about was that Virginia was moving to support an overturn to Roe v. Wade. Can you expand on that decision? All we did, I and mean, listen, when I ran, I, I never hid the fact that I'm, I'm pro-life. I believe in exceptions of rape, incest, or threat to the mother's life. Uh, the previous attorney general signed on to California's amicus brief. California has some of the most extreme far-left abortion laws in the entire country. Uh, abortion anytime, anywhere, up until the moment of birth, paid for by taxpayers. 
that's an extreme position. And so we simply said, listen, we're not going to be signed on to California's amicus briefs. We're going to get off and tell the, the court why. Well, not surprisingly, we have a different change in policy. But more than that, we think the, the Constitution's silent on the issue of abortion. Let the states decide. That's our position. Let the 50 states make this determination instead of a one-size-fit-all, which is what we currently have in the current legal structure. Last news item of the day. Okay. Did Tim Heafy's role uh, helping to investigate on the January 6th Select Committee, uh, did that play into your decision to fire him Zero. from the UVA? Zero. Nothing at all? Nope. Had nothing to do with it. Do you support the work of the January 6th Select Committee? I'm fine with anybody looking at January 6th, but it had zero to do with the fact that uh, our team decided to make a change. What was the reason? I'm not going to get into internal policy decisions, but it was internal. Had nothing to do with any work on January 6th. Okay. Moving on. Policies. Let's first and foremost start with um, gun violence. We know that in Richmond, in Northern Virginia, in the Hampton Roads area, the, fa the fatalities, people dying from guns on the street, many illegal, uh, not registered, it is quite the issue. You have also indicated during the campaign that you wanted to take um, your office to oversee local investigations where it may see fit. Is your, planning, is your office planning to go into those locales and investigate on your own kind of the, the scourge of the gun violence to try and, and bring the numbers down? Well, listen, we're going to go after those hardened violent criminals that are these repeat offenders that are using guns in the commission of a crime. So we've actually sought money in the state budget, Project Ceasefire, that allow us to team up with the U.S. Attorney's Office to go after some of these individuals. I'm old enough to remember when Richmond was the murder capital per capita of America, and at that time it was called Project Exile. It was something done in the 1990s to great effect. And the idea is you get these hardened repeat offenders that are using guns in the commission of felonies, and you go after them. You get them off our streets. You make sure they, they go after stiff federal sentences. You team up with the U.S. Attorney's Office, and you get them off the street. That's a very, very different attitude than some of these so-called social justice prosecutors that are just deciding to have a soft-on-crime approach. Very, very different mindset. So uh, that is going to be a huge part of what we're going to be doing is tackling gun violence by going after those people that are law-breaking and that are using a gun and commission of a felony, we're absolutely going to be going after you. And on that subject, there is a bill right now uh, making strides in the Senate right now, which would eradicate some mandatory minimums with the exception of you know, gunning down a police officer. If that passes the Senate, even before it passes the Senate, are you going to come out and say, hey, let's I pump the brakes? I that legislation. That is, that, is one of the, that is exactly the type of criminal first victim last mindset that we've seen in Richmond the last two years and it's to why I'm sitting in this office and Governor Youngkin's sitting in his. It's a big reason why. Is Virginians saw that we have a murder rate the highest it's been in over two decades and they said enough is enough. One of our big problems in government is you have all these politicians that think good intentions guarantee good results. They have passed law after law that made it easier for the criminals and harder for police and then we're somehow shocked that our crime rate has surged and Virginians have said enough is enough. There's a new sheriff in town. I absolutely oppose that bill. It is one of the foolish things that you could possibly do. I could tell you as a prosecutor, the vast, vast, vast majority of violent crimes done by repeat offenders. Get the repeat offenders off our streets. You'll be shocked at how quickly crime goes down. Those are the policies we adopted in the 1990s. And it led to our crime rate dropping down year after year until about two to three years ago when it started increasing. We have adopted some very, very foolish criminal first policies the last two years in Richmond. That needs to end. And I candidly am very, very confident Governor Yunkin would veto that bill if it ever hit his desk to begin with, as he should. What, what about uh, proponents of or advocates of those who say that some offenders with drug charges are getting sentenced uh, too harshly as well. Well, you have to differentiate between the drug dealers and the drug users. Drug users need compassion, they need help, they need rehabilitation. Drug dealers are overwhelmingly tied, oftentimes they're tied to organized crime elements and gangs, and those individuals oftentimes, they're also dealing drugs with guns. So you go after those individuals and you get them off our streets. So listen, if you're, if you're a drug dealer, particularly if you're drilling dug, drugs near a school or you're targeting kids, you absolutely. But there was a bill last year in the General Assembly that would end mandatory minimums for all drug dealers, including second offense dealing drugs to a child at a school or a bus stop. In other words, I'm a drug dealer. I've been convicted once before dealing drugs to a kid. I get out and get convicted a second time. And the people in the General Assembly decided... 
well, that's, that's too harsh. No, there needs to be a mandatory minimum. And it means a threshold floor. It just says we have decided that there are going to be certain punishments that are, that, that, that are warranted, that there is going to be a threshold. We don't care who you are, your background, your socioeconomic standards. There is a minimum floor that says that crime, there's going to be a minimum punishment associated with it. When you get rid of it, you have judges that decide to make random decisions where they, they let people out with just, sometimes with just months. And you've seen that in California time and time again, where there are, there are no mandatory minimums. You just had a beautiful young college student who just graduated, who got stabbed to death in a, in, a, in a store that she was clerking in by a perpetrator should have never been back on the street. Why? No mandatory minimums. You have a bunch of left-wing judges going soft on criminals, getting them back on the street. Mandatory minimums assure that judges aren't making those kind of mistakes. If there's a minimum floor, they're going to keep some of these worst offenders off our streets where they're not committing more. When it comes to drugs specifically, a lot of the attention, uh, and, and you know, rightfully so, is on gun violence and how pervasive it is. But when it comes to drugs, more people are dying from drug overdoses, yeah. substantially more. Mm -hmm. I mean, in our reporting, just in RVA alone, fentanyl over the last 10 years yep. has become the primary reason why people are dying from drugs. How does your office start to combat that? Well, listen, we have a crisis at the border. I mean, we have a, a human crisis with the migration problem, but then you have more than that. The cartels understand that our border security is distracted by people trying to cross our border, and so they're flooding with fentanyl, and it's more pervasive than ever, and it's, it's difficult. You have to go after those dealers. You have to have to systematically go after the dealers. A lot of them, when you look at so many of these criminal elements, they, they overlap. Usually, if you're a drug dealer, you're also in possession of a firearm. That means my office can go after you. And we identify through confidential informants working with the U.S. Attorney's Office and others who are the individuals that are the drug dealers. You go after them, you target it. The, the one thing about it in, in the law, if you're dealing drugs with a firearm, there are a variety of enhanced penalties, so we can go after those dealers. A lot of it is working with law enforcement. You're giving them the tools they need to do their job. They feel valued because right now we're down 380, 380 members of the state police. That's how far down we are. So we got to get our recruitment up. More officers on the street means we can identify the drug dealers and we can go after them. You have to take them out, cut the head off the snake, and go after these dealers systematically. That requires intelligence, investigation, boots on the ground, prosecutors and officers willing to do their job, prosecute them to the maximum extent of the law, get them off our street, and let them understand that in Virginia you do not get an easy pass. When, when, when drug dealers find out they're not getting an easy pass in Virginia, they're going to shift tactics and go into other areas where they're armed. What's the latest on your investigation of the parole board? Uh, we have a great team that's looking at it, and that's all I'm going to comment at this time. Have you asked any judge to convene a grand jury? Uh, I'm not going to make any comments on the parole board investigation until we've concluded. That's only fair to the people that are going to be the subject of the investigation. Uh, we have a great team. They're diligently uh, moving forward. And when we have some information, we'll pass that on. Has it sunk in yet, the historic nature of your joining the office as Attorney General? Uh, it's been uh, pretty amazing. I mean, in the sense uh, of last week being sworn in and taking the same office once held by John Marshall and Edmund Randolph and others. And uh, the fact that my, my mother was able to stand there and be there at the portico and see me get sworn in about 56 years uh, after she fled homeless from a communist dictatorship that had no respect for Bill of Rights, no respect for individual dignity. Uh, the fact that she could see then her son uh, take the office that is really in charge of uh, being kind of that backstop and that protector of our constitutional rights and liberties. I think that was a special moment. Um, I love to say if your family came to this country seeking hope and opportunity, uh, there's a good chance your family is a lot like my family. It's the biggest honor of my life to be uh, the Attorney General for all Virginians but also for what I call new Virginians, our immigrant community as well. It's exciting. Thanks, sir. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Appreciate it.